So we can start now. So yeah, first, uh, let me introduce the speaker for today's talk. We've invited Dr. Adrian Dalka, who has expertise in machine learning techniques for medical image analysis. Dr. Adrian Dalka obtained his PhD from Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT. And now he's an assistant professor at Mass General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and research scientist at the MIT. His research focuses on probabilistic models and machine learning techniques to capture relationships between medical images, clinical diagnosis, and other complex medical data. So today he will talk about new machine learning models for accurate image registration. So I'm really looking forward to hearing his talk. So Adrian, do you wanna start? Yeah, great, mm -hmm. thank you. And every, you can hear me well and see the slides and everything. Yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, so uh, thank you for having me and thanks for being here. Uh, so, so, right, so I'm going to talk mostly about image alignment and registration and particularly how a new kind of machine learning based paradigm has changed how we do things. But in, importantly, it's changed, I think, the sort of analyses or the sort of data that we can look at uh, specifically in neuroimaging. Uh, and please, sort of feel free to interrupt and ask questions throughout. It's a lot better than if I, if I uh, sort of say something stupid or it doesn't make sense. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to talk about neuroimaging. I'm sure everyone here is super familiar and so on. But I did want to make the point that uh, everything I talk about is really broadly applicable. And, you know, it, it sort of, uh, you can apply it to across different images and different anatomy parts and so on. Uh, so the story of this talk really starts back in my PhD when uh, we started this very uh, kind of uh, great collaboration with a stroke group at MGH where we really wanted to analyze large collections of images. These were uh, taken of patients who have had a stroke uh, in the last sort of 48 hours. And we wanted to build all kinds of analysis algorithms for these. Um, we, we did things like segmenting certain strokes, segmenting white matter disease or small vessel disease. Uh, we did things like building uh, progression models, uh, sort of trying to analyze how disease changes uh, with age. Um, we, we then looked at turning that into predictive models. Um, can we see, can we predict how a disease is going to change in a patient based on their genetics or their sort of medical characteristics and so on. Um, and so we build all these models, uh, or we were exciting to build all these models, but um, at the heart of all these models was uh, this uh, image alignment or image registration step. And in my PhD, we had an incredible amount of difficulty with this step um, for a couple of reasons. The main reason is that up until this point in my PhD, most of the people in our field worked with very small data sets, which meant that the algorithms that were designed didn't really care about runtime. They cared about being accurate, but they didn't care about doing things fast. And um, at the time, the state-of-the-art algorithm uh, to register images, as an example, took two hours to register two MRI scans. Um, and I'll go into all of sort of the detail of why that is, but uh, you can imagine that registering thousands of images um, was now a bottleneck. But more than that, if you wanted to build rich models that involved registration, it meant that you didn't just do the registration or the alignment once. You kind of had to do it over and over as you were developing, as you were trying new models. And so this really kind of limited what we could do at the time. Um, and it, it, what I'm going to talk about today is a significant sort of paradigm shift that takes us to runtimes that instead of two hours per scan, it takes us to runtimes that are less than a minute per scan if you have a CPU. If you have a GPU, it's about a second or less than a second. And this is significantly faster instead of waiting weeks to register your data set, you could do it over lunch. So that's, that's nice. 
But the other thing that this allows us to do that I'm really excited about is it, it allows us to explore models that we just couldn't do before. Even if we wanted to, they weren't feasible. Okay, so just to be very clear, I'm gonna talk about registration. What registration, when I say registration, I mean finding a dense correspondence field between two images. Um, and so uh, for every location in one image, it tells me how to move that voxel so that it matches up with the other image. So the goal is to find this field. Okay. Um, this task is uh, everywhere in image analysis uh, from sort of large scale neuroanatomy studies to uh, the clinic where you might want to register a previous scan to a, a current scan or a scan before a surgery to after surgery. Um, you might want to do direct comparison between two subjects. Uh, you might want to use registration to propagate a previous label from a previous scan to a new scan, say for a tumor to see how it's changed. Um, it's also really the same problem over and over in other domains. Uh, as an example, I, I did some computational biology work in my undergrad and there we were aligning um, genomes. And so it's really the exact same problem. It's just 1D instead of 3D. Uh, so it's a very, very fundamental task. And because it's a fundamental task, there's been a lot of work. So in particular in medical imaging, there's been decades of work on this. How do we uh, register two images? And the main approach has always been, the intuition has always been that you get one image and you uh, sort of deform it or wiggle it in some smart way until it aligns with the second image. And we do this by optimizing some, uh, some function that I really like because it has these intuitive terms. It basically says, find the optimal uh, deformation field that matches up one image with another and is, uh, has some regularity. And over the decades, people have come up with ways to uh, define this image matching term and depending on the task, um, to define different regularization terms that have different guarantees or, or different anatomical sort of constraints. Uh, people have come up with different ways to optimize this entire uh, sort of loss function. And so there's been a great deal of development that we can learn from, but all of these methods are intrinsically slow in the sense that every time you get two new MRIs and you want to align them, you start the process from scratch. You pretend you've never seen MRIs before and now you're optimizing or you're starting to kind of uh, deform these images until they match. And intrinsically that's a slow process. Um, and very recently, uh, well, in the last, let's say, three years, um, these machine learning methods came about. And the idea here was that we want to treat this problem as a regression problem. Um, we're going to try to learn this regressor, this uh, nowadays a neural network, that takes in two images and just gives me the deformation field. And to train this, we need pairs of images and the ground truth deformation field, or at least that was, those were the original methods. And you know, we need thousands of these. And the problem with this is it's a really difficult sort of task. And so we need a lot of data, which means we need a lot of ground truth deformation fields. We need to know the deformation between images to train this regressor. But of course, the challenge is we don't have the ground truth deformation fields in the first place. Um, in fact, in some ways, there is no such thing as ground truth deformation. We don't quite know what the deformation field should be. Um, and so you could get deformation fields. You could simulate them. You could run the classical models. But it kind of defeats the purpose. We wanted to learn this neural network that could do things fast. And now we're going to have to first run the classical method for thousands of pairs. And so it didn't really make sense. And this is the, the sort of part uh, in a field where we came along and we thought, well, it would be really nice if you could learn, you could take advantage of these machine learning methods, but learn such a neural network without needing ground truth. 
So with just using the data that you have. Um, and so that's the method I'm gonna talk about today that we call voxel morph. And so just as a summary, these supervised method, they, um, they have the advantage that once the method is trained, if, if it's trained successfully, it could be really, really fast, but you needed ground truth data and they didn't really build on the previous methods of previous registration methods. They didn't sort of take any lessons from that. And so the sort of outline of the rest of the presentation is kind of split into two big parts. One of them is the first part is just a, a few minutes. I will talk about the main idea of voxel morph. Um, now there's a lot of different aspects and I just kind of cover it from a big picture, but I'm happy to take questions or go into any detail. Um, of how we combine sort of some insights from classical methods and registration uh, that was built on like knowledge of anatomy and so on to um, with neural network methods to achieve kind of the best of both worlds. And then I'm gonna spend a good chunk of the talk then talking about how this changes the sort of thing we can do how we can deal with having very little data or having auxiliary data or having sort of low quality data or how could we sort of do new things like building templates really fast. Um, so that's the outline. I'm gonna stop for a second. Are there any questions with kind of the setup, the registration, the challenges, things like that? Okay, I'll take silence as no. Um, so as a setup, right? So uh, the, the sort of supervised methods I talked about are trying to do the following. The idea is you take in two uh, brain images. Um, now everything I'm showing, by the way, I'm showing these 2D slices everywhere, but it's really, this works in, in 3D. It's just, obviously it's just easier to show 2D slices. So I take these two brain images, I push them through some neural network and the neural network gives me a deformation field. Now, at the beginning, that deformation field the neural network gives me is completely random. And so uh, how do we tell the neural network to adapt to give me better deformation fields? Well, we're gonna use this supervised loss um, if we have ground truth data. And essentially all this uh, does is it tells the network, hey, the deformation field should have been this and now it's this, so let's uh, sort of adapt the parameters. But again, we wanna deal with not having ground truth deformations because in most scenarios, in most studies, you're just gonna have the data itself, the scans. And so how do we do this? Well, this is where we thought, well, we could bring various models from the classical methods because in the classical methods, the sort of optimization-based methods, we had loss functions that told us whether a deformation field is good or bad. And what that did is it, it sort of told us, well, does the deformation ma field match one image with another? And is the deformation field smooth? And so we can borrow those sort of loss functions and try to train a neural network using those loss functions. Now there's some important differences here. So in classical methods, we optimized this loss function that had these two terms for every pair of images. But here, we want to learn a network that will give us a good deformation field for all pairs of images. So in some sense, my loss function is summing up over all the possible pairs in my data set and making sure that all those deformation fields are good. And so here I've added a sum to the loss function. Um, but going even a little bit deeper, the deformation fields here are given by the network. And so all I'm doing intuitively is I'm updating the parameters of the network based on this intuition that every deformation field that I get should match up my images and it should be smooth in some way. Um, and so in some sense, I'm using, we're using the, the sort of uh, neural network infrastructure that people have been developing in machine learning 
with um, loss functions, um, and as I'm gonna quickly mention, uh, sort of underlying models of anatomy that people have developed from classical literature. Okay, now how we actually implement this is uh, the neural network gives us this deformation field, and then we actually take the deformation field, take an image, warp it inside the network, and then we can sort of tell, hey, is this warped image, does it match up with the fixed image or not, and how can we improve it by adjusting the parameters of the neural net? Um, so that's kind of the summary, uh, sort of a big picture summary of this framework that we call Voxomorph. Now, you can change all kinds of aspects of this. You can change how you represent the deformation field. You can change the loss functions exactly, your image loss or your regularization and so on. But at the end of the day, the takeaway is that you're, by showing the network a bunch of different pairs and only images, you never need to seek ground truth deformation, the network learns to register images. Intuitively, because it sees a bunch of different pairs, by the time it sees its hundredth pair, it says, oh, I know what to do. I've seen this stuff before. Um, and then once we, in theory, once we train this, registration is very, very simple. You just take in two images, you pass them through the neural network, and uh, you get your deformation field. So it should be really fast. Um, a couple of just sort of technical, quick technical comments. What I've just described is referred to as amortized inference or amortized learning. The idea is that we used to do something by running an optimization for every instance in our, in our data set. And now what we do is we run a similar optimization over the entire data set. We learn this global entity and now this global entity approximates the end of our optimization. It approximates our registration. So we've kind of amortized. And then another, another technical comment behind the scenes is that um, there's a lot of uh, uh, sort of details I can go into about how this relates to probabilistic models and anatomical models, um, all of which lead to changing the loss function in the neural network. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the, a big picture overview of how voxelmorph works. Before I kind of go into does it actually work in practice? Uh, I wanted to see if there are any questions. Is this kind of clear from a machine learning point of view or is it clear from like a utility point of view? I, I do have one question that's the, I, I'm Xiao and I'm a software engineer here in the NIST group. And I do have one question about the, about the, about this approach and compared to the the typical optical flow approach the, from the computer science and the, how will you compare this one with the, the, the optical pro approaches the, in computer science? Yeah, so I think there are a lot of similarities to optical flow. Um, I think under certain settings uh, of the loss function that I described, um, it, it's very similar to optical flow. It's basically finding features to match up. Um, I think there's quite a lot of some, uh, differences. Um, in optical flow, you need to deal, it, usually the task is different, right? You're, you're sort of tracking a moving object or something. You need to, you have very good features. You need to deal with things like occlusions. You only care about certain parts of the image. Um, here, it's a lot more kind of a whole field estimate. We care about every part of the image. We care about a very fine scale details, right? And registration, like a, a pixel change or two in the hippocampus can be important, um, which is again, very different. And so I think the big picture intuition is similar. You're basically tracking changes or you're, you're finding correspondences. But uh, the, the differences are, signif you know, are significant. The other thing is optical flow. It, it's, it's actually only about the same time around 2018 that optical flow started being done in an unsupervised fashion in registration. So it's, it's actually kind of parallel development where they were able to kind of uh, use sort of neural networks for optical flow in a non-supervised fashion. Before that, what they would do is very similar to registration. They would find the optical flow using some classical method, then they would train a network using it, which is 
kind of cumbersome. Many thanks. Any other questions? Happy to move. Okay, so let's see. Does this entire thing actually work? Um, this sort of way of approximating uh, registration. So the very first experiments that we ran, we really thought about, you know, we thought we were in this deep learning regime. And so we thought, okay, we need a lot of data. We downloaded a ton of T1 um, brain images uh, from, I think it was some seven data sets. We got 7,000 images to train. Um, and here's the result. And then I'm going to talk about all these aspects of training. So the first thing we cared about was runtime, right? And as I gave you a peek earlier on, the classical methods were very slow. It took a couple hours for this method called ANTS that is probably the most sort of popular, was the most popular classical method. There are some methods out there that are faster, 10 to 30 minutes, uh, but they kind of lose a little bit of accuracy and robustness. Um, and the method voxelmorph that I talked about is more on the order of uh, 30 seconds now. It was 50 seconds the first time. And if you have a GPU, it's less than a second. So, uh, okay, we've achieved the runtime part. And now the question is, does it do equally well in terms of accuracy? Um, now, how do we measure registration? Turns out that's not so easy. Uh, and so the best or way we have is we're going to uh, segment a bunch of structures on the two scans, the moving and the fixed scan. So here, you know, we're segmenting uh, ventricles and so on. And then when we warp an image, we also warp the structures. And so you can see here, I, I went from the moving image, I warped it with voxel morph, and now I'm looking at these structures and I'm comparing them with the fixed structures. And, you know, visually, they kind of match. How does it do quantitatively? So we can look at um, a measure of how well the volumes um, overlap in terms of dice, higher is better. Um, and the main takeaway of this graph is that the baseline and voxel morph really have the same result uh, for every different structure that you see on the, y, on the x axis. So voxel morph can match these classical methods, but it can operate you know, orders of magnitude faster. And this will enable us to do a bunch of new things. Now it's got some interesting properties as well. It's, um, if you build in the loss function to make sure voxel morph is diffeomorphic, meaning it's uh, topologically consistent and invertible. Uh, so if you go from a, scan A to B, you can go from scan B to A. Um, it turns out a lot of the classical methods attempt to do this and it's built into the model, but depending on the numerical choices you make, you might actually have areas of the brain that are not invertible. So here I'm showing the number of voxels in the brain that are not invertible with, the, with one of the baselines we ran. Uh, whereas voxel morph is completely diffeomorphic um, if you make sort of the right choices of loss function, which is really useful because you're still getting that property all within a very, very fast runtime. Uh, we also have things like uncertainty, where every location in the brain, we know not only what the registration should be, but how sure the algorithm was of that registration. So in certain areas where you have high contrast, it'll be very sure. But in certain areas, like the middle of the white matter, you might say, well, I don't really know. There's some ambiguity here. Can I ask you a quick question here? Sure. Um, on a couple of slides back, the dice scores seem to be pretty low in ventricle, CSF. And then, so I was wondering why that would be so low for that same reason you just brought up, that there's sharp contrast between the CSF brain border. So why do you think the dice scores are so low in the CSF? Uh, the CSF in particular, I think, is maybe a little different than the ventricles in this case, simply mm -hmm. because it's a, uh, so if the very first experiments we ran uh, were on uh, skull stripped images. And I think there's variation in how the images are skull stripped, which sort of creates a variation in exactly where the CSF is. But the vent to your, to your point about ventricles, I think it has a lot to do, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but I think it has a lot to do with the fact that 
we were reg we had one app this was all registration to an atlas and so we had this one atlas that we were trying to make you know to cover 7000 images with and it really covered 18 year olds to 90 year olds and so on so i think it's an issue of given the data it's doing as well as it can but it's probably really hard to match the atlas that has decently sized ventricles with the teenager that has very small ventricles. Um, and so I think if you, these numbers would be a little higher if you were matching, for example, if you were matching you know, previous scans to current scans or yeah. something like that. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so that's kind of the outline of how this works. Um, and now the question is, okay, what can we do with this? Um, and so I'm gonna talk about a bunch of different little kind of tricks and projects and uh, stuff like that, that is hopefully interesting. And so the very first thing that always comes to mind, that sort of the question we get is, well, you trained with 7,000 images, that sounds a bit crazy. Um, what if I just have you know, my own little data set of whatever it is, 50 images, uh, can I still use Voxelmorph? And so there's a couple of answers there, but we did this analysis where we looked at, okay, what if your training data set is only 10 images? What if it's 25? What if it's 50? And how well do those models do? Um, and of course, you don't have to retrain Voxelmorph every time, but let's say your data set is different. You're, you have a different modality or you know, different patient population or something. And so what we came up with is that without any bells and whistles, without any fancy kind of tricks in the learning, if you have 10 images, you won't get quite state-of-the-art results of the classical methods, but you'll get pretty close. And then by the time you get to 50 or 100, you're basically at the state-of-the-art. But the thing is, because you get really close in this very fast one shot, then um, you can take that result and you can optimize it a little more for every pair, just for a few seconds. And now you're at the state-of-the-art. So even with a very small data set of 10 subjects, um, you can, Voxelmorph can help you tremendously by, by sort of taking that runtime down from two hours to a few seconds um, because it gives you a very good initialization. Once you're at 50 subjects or something like that, you're, you're done. Uh, so you don't need big data sets. But one other question that we explored was, well, do you actually need data at all in the sense that if I train on certain anatomy and I test on slightly different anatomy, um, is that really, does that, will that not generalize? And the way we kind of took this to an extreme is we synthesized images uh, that don't really have any anatomy. Um, they're just kind of blobs of different sizes. And we basically told Voxelmorph, hey, Try to match up these images. And then once you match up these images, when we train, once we train that, um, can we test it on brain data and see if it does a good job? The intuition here is that Voxelmorph most likely does not learn sort of uh, modality, um, sorry, anatomy-specific things. It most likely just learns to match up shapes together and so maybe just training with shapes will do fine, and then you'll have this method that is broadly useful. Um, and the way we did this is we synthesized a bunch of images that have shapes that are slightly, uh, slight changes from one another. So you can see these two images are similar, but they're, they're a little bit different. So you see this kind of green blob here. It's a little thicker here, for example, right? So it includes the same blobs, but they're slightly different. And now, we, we sort of synthesize these label maps, we generate image maps from them, we feed it to Voxelmorph and we tell it to register. And um, I have a bunch of slides at the end because I think I'm gonna run, run out of time if I go into details for every one of these methods, but the kind of conclusion is that this works as well as the classical methods. So we learn to register blobs to blobs we then apply this network to brains, to T1 MRIs, T1, T2 MRIs, and a bunch of different modalities. And it has the same accuracy as classical methods. So the takeaway is that you can 
teach these neural nets not to register brains, but you can just teach them to kind of match up random shapes and it will work. I have a quick question there. Yeah. Do you, in your input data, do you have to have something that is relevant in terms of the blob sizes? Like if you don't have something as so, the size of a hippocampi, can it learn how to segment a hippocampi? Yes. Are there some questions like that that you need to pay attention to? It's a great question. Um, okay, the answer I think is yes. Um, but we haven't thoroughly analyzed it. We've analyzed it a little bit in that dramatic changes in uh, the sizes that we simulate um, can lower your uh, accuracy. So if you only have big blobs, for example, but quite how sensitive you are, do you have to have something that's exactly the size of the hippocampus, for example? We haven't sort of quantitatively measured that. But what we do now is we have blobs of all different sizes. So as you can kind of see in this image, sometimes they're really, really small, sometimes they're really, really big, and sometimes it's in between. And with a big enough network, it kind of has to take care of all of them, big and small. And you need to have like something that it undulates like a cortex, for example, because it can it learn to find a shape that is, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So we, so to do that, we also vary the, so the way we create them is we create one label map and then we warp, warp it to create the second label map essentially. And so we can all, the same way that we play with the blobs, we play with the warp, right? So sometimes it's a very smooth warp, sometimes it's less smooth. Again, we can probably do a more thorough job on how much we vary that, but the takeaway is that yes, if you kind of create a range of those deformations, I think it sort of does the job. Uh, the one caveat is these networks have to be much, much bigger because they learn to deal with a lot more than just what you would have in, the, in a very particular brain data. Um, but once you have those big networks, they work. Okay, now let's go to the other extreme. You have your images, but let's say you really care about one region and, you know, you kind of want everything to be registered, but you really care about the accuracy, say, around the hippocampus. Now, this is something that was difficult to do in classical methods. You maybe would have to tune some hyperparameters, things like that. But here, what we can do is, in training, you could label a few images or get some labeled images from somewhere, um, just for a few, maybe just for five images. And you can tell the algorithm that for those images, it shouldn't just align an image to another, but it should also make sure that it aligns the hippocampal maps, right? So the, the sort of outline maps of the hippocampus. Now, what's important here is that the network does not see the label maps. It just is part of the loss function. And the reason that matters is because once you train this network, at test time, you, you only need the images. But what the network learns to do during training is it learns to pay special attention to the hippocampus. So it learns kind of where the hippocampus is internally, and it learns to be more careful there or spend more of its parameters in aligning that region because that's part of the loss function. And once we did that, for the first time, we saw that these machine learning methods are not only much faster, but they're also dramatically improving the registration accuracy in the regions that we train it to be careful in. Now, to be clear, in test time, so when we're actually running our analysis, we only give it images. We don't tell the network anything about where the hippocampus is but it has learned internally where it is and to be careful around that region. Um, and another, so this is again changing gears a little bit, but another thing you uh, uh, deal with a lot of the time when you run registration is tuning important parameters. And so a couple of things happen with classical methods. Um, uh, especially in registration, you might have this hyperparameter, for example, that trades off between 
do you want to match your images or do you want anatomical sort of consistency, anatomical smoothness? Like which one is more important and how do you balance those two? And so what we would do at least in classical methods is you would try you know, five different parameters and then you would look at the results and you would sort of say, okay, this parameter makes the most sense. And of course, to try different parameters, you have to run the optimization five times. And so that's costly. And that hyperparameter could vary with different, you know, different, different populations or something. And so that was an exhausting thing to do. It took compute time, it took sort of human effort. And the unfortunate truth is that most people don't have the time to tune this. And so you're very likely to use the defaults of the algorithm, but those will often be suboptimal. And so that means that you're affecting the entire analysis downstream of this registration. Um, in neural networks, this is even worse because now you're not just talking about doing an optimization for every hyperparameter, but you're talking about training a whole new neural network for every hyperparameter value. So that is quite exhausting. And so what we have for Voxomorph, we have these kind of defaults that we've trained for different classes of things like T1 MP rage that was kind of normalized. Um, and people use those defaults, but it's a bit crazy. A lot of times people sort of contact us and they say, well, why well, is your defaults? I'm registering lungs. And I can, I understand why it's really hard to tune these. Um, you know, you have to train different models, but you really get suboptimal performance. And so this, uh, uh, we did this very recent project called Hypermorph where we realized that a network could also learn the effect of the hyperparameter on your deformation field. So this network, like Voxomorph, takes in two images, but it also takes the hyperparameter that you think might be appropriate. And so the advantage is that now, instead of training a bunch of different models with a bunch of different hyperparameter values, and then maybe training some more later as you adjust, you train just one model, one big model that knows, okay, if you're tuning the hyperparameter this way or that way, here's how it changes your deformation. So let me show you um, a demo of this. So because you have the model trained, you can do this in near real time. What I'm showing you here is on the left is the source image, the image we want to essentially move. On the right is the target image. And in the middle is the moved image. So how much I'm moving the image from the left. So right now I'm tuning this hyperparameter and I'm saying all I care about is smoothness. I don't care about matching the images. I just care about the deformation being smooth. So obviously the smoothest deformation I can get is no deformation at all, right? So that's what's happening. This source image is not changing at all. But I can manually, very quickly, without rerunning the optimization, uh, drag this and my model is going to tell me what this looks like under different hyperparameters. So as I go all the way back, all the way to just caring about image similarity and not caring at, about, at all about smoothness, you can see that the image starts getting distorted quite a bit and you start having all these sort of weird artifacts. And so this allows a user to kind of choose the optimal hyperparameter for the type of image that they are registering. Um, the advantage being, again, that you only have to train one network and now you can do this in real time. The other sort of what we think is a really big advantage is that it turns out the optimal hyperparameter varies with a lot of things. So for example, if we look at different data sets, this here on the y-axis is the dice score and on the x-axis is the hyperparameter value. And it turns out, and so what I'm plotting here is a dice score if I had used that hyperparameter value in that data set. And so I can see that in certain data sets like the UK Biobank, which has generally good quality images, there's an optimal hyperparameter here kind of in the middle. 
But for other data sets like Abide, where um, obviously there's autism and uh, uh, the, there's a lot of younger patients, um, you actually want to choose a different hyperparameter value. And so with a model like ours, you can actually just tune this hyperparameter value by data set, either by looking at some subjects or if you have some validation segmentation or something like that. Whereas classically, honestly, you couldn't really do it in practice. You would have to learn way too many optimizations. Um, it turns, sorry, was, did someone have a question? Yeah, could I ask a quick question? Yeah. This is Jeff, um, hey. thanks so much. Um, in practical terms, what is the difference between a dice score of like 76 and 78, you know, across this range of hyperparameter values? So a couple of answers. Uh, thank you. I, 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 to be honest, I don't know how to answer in practical terms, but basically um, two dice points, I think gets close to the point where you can, and for very subtle disease effects, for example, you could start losing the signal. Um, but I also want to highlight that in some cases, it's a lot more than um, uh, two dice points. And I'll, I'll show a few more slides. So in some cases, it's less, right? So here, for example, GSP, okay, you're looking at 79, or if you chose something here at 78.5. In that case, it doesn't matter. But in some cases, it can be more, like if you chose the optimal hyperparameter here versus here, it can be three or as I'm gonna show in a couple of sizes, it can be even more. And so there, I think the point is if you're trying to analyze these um, you know, large population with very, very subtle disease effects, uh, you might lose those effects if you chose the, the wrong hyperparameter value. Or if you're, if you're registering a scan before or after surgery and what you really care about, did you resect the entire tumor or whatever the surgery is for, again, millimeters matter, right? And so uh, that could be an effect. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah that's great, thanks. Um, I should also mention that uh, in other data sets, it matters more. I'm kind of co also covering neuroimaging here. That's maybe the deformations are smaller, but you know, if you're measuring lung inhalation, exhalation, things like that, there's, the differences are even bigger. Um, it matters by task. So if you register within subject or across subjects, um, uh, you should choose very different hyperparameter values. But even with what anatomy you care about, so if you care about the pallidum, uh, it turns out you should choose a different hyperparameter value than if you care about the hippocampus uh, or others. Um, and so again, having this model allows you to kind of very quickly do this. Um, okay, okay, a couple of other things that I really like uh, just slightly different gears that I'll go quickly through. One thing is everything I'm talking about are what I would call and what I called in, in, my, in my PhD uh, research quality scans. So scans that are of high resolution, they look good in every way you slice them. Um, you know, they're mostly subjects who are well behaved in the scanner and so on. Um, but a lot of clinical scans look very differently. Um, and so the, 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 the stroke scans that I was working with in my PhD looked like this. Um, you know, there's, there's thick slices, there's more noise, there's more motion. And it turns out that classical methods just can't work on these scans. Uh, they have uh, significant difficulties, mostly because these thick slices are not conducive to smooth gradients and so on. And so in my PhD, I spent a lot of time modifying those methods to get them to work. And eventually we got them to work. Um, but even so, voxelmorph turns out to work significantly better almost out of the box. Um, and so ANTS, which is sort of the, the king of classical registration, would get 72 dice uh, for certain structures that we looked at um, after we modified it to be more robust to these sort of scans. And voxelmorph uh, can achieve significantly higher dice, so about a, a six dice improvement. This method in the middle is a, a modification uh, basically uh, that we came up with a few years ago, but it's also very, very slow and only kind of uh, improves half of the way. And so voxelmorph now is not only sort of faster, but it still uh, it achieves this improvement. And the main reason it achieves the improvement is because it gets to look at a bunch of this data. And so it gets to learn how to 
get over local minima and all kinds of issues because it has these large data sets available. Um, and a final thing I want to cover because it's often uh, a big question that we have is template construction. So a lot of times you might to do some large scale analyses, you might uh, register to a reference and a lot of times you might want to build your own reference that represents your own data as opposed to registering to um, uh, some common reference that you download from MNI or something like that. And so the question is, how do you build your own templates? And the standard approach is um, the standard sort of tools out there are uh, to take all your data and register it to some initial template, usually some blurry brain. Um, and then once you've registered everyone, which takes a lot of time, you average those registered images. Now you have a slightly sharper atlas and our template, and you do this thing over and over again. So you re-register, re-average, re-register, re-average. It takes a long time. Um, now, with voxel morph, because its registration is faster, that whole process can be made a little faster. But we started thinking, you know, we're learning a network, and the network is really this kind of global representation of the data set anyway. Like, you're learning something about the data set, so could we have the network learn the template as well? And what we did is instead of giving the network a template and an image and learn to register, we made this template unknown. We basically told the network, why don't you estimate this template at the same time? And by seeing a bunch of images, it will hopefully learn what is the kind of the best template to register to all these images. So, Really, it's just a super simple modification to voxelmorph, and without very sophisticated kind of like, uh, uh, you know, without any anatomical modeling and without any bells and whistles on the network, this is the um, atlas that we got for the particular T1 MP rage data set that we were working with. Now, probably the, the state-of-the-art uh, uh, tool, um, atlas that you might download would be sharper and uh, have other properties, but we found this to be very promising because again, there was no sort of specific modeling. It was all just sort of learn from the data with basically no modifications to Voxmorph, except the fact that we're telling it to learn a template. Um, and so the reason this excited us is because it means that we can make these sort of small modifications to our model and keep improving uh, or, or keep tackling new tasks. And so one of the things that we've always kind of struggled with if we have large data sets is, well, how many atlases do we build? Do we build one atlas? Do we build different atlases that cover the different age ranges? Do we build one atlas for the disease population and one for the healthy population and so on? So how do we do all this? And in Voxelmorph, it turns out you can do this very elegant continuous representation by saying, well, I don't actually want to learn a template. I want to learn a function of some characteristics we care about. So for example, let's just take age as an example. What I'm going to say is we're going to feed the network the age of the patient, say, you know, 50 years old. And the template, the network will learn to give us the best template for 50 year olds. So this is continuous. I don't have to discretize my population or anything. I'm just learning a function of that characteristic. And you can put any characteristic in there that you might have uh, that, that you care about. And so again, we kind of threw just the data at this. Now, our data mostly ranged from 40 to 90 year olds, but we had some younger patients from the abide data. Um, but just as an illustration of what this does, here is what it learns. Now, this is sort of the age range. Um, and again, these templates are maybe not as accurate because there's very little data, but, um, and here I'm showing seven instantiations of that function, but of course it learns a continuous thing. So let's look at it as a video. So here's the templates, here's the age changing. So uh, I'm gonna go back a little bit. Uh, here we go again. So you can see things like the ventricle is expanding. You can see overall atrophy in certain regions. I'll play it again. Um, 
And again, all of this is just learned from uh, these MP rage images that we had we ha without any spatial temporal consistency and modeling and, and so on. Um, we can also look more quantitatively at our data. Uh, you know, does it get patterns of the hippocampus shrinking and ventricles expanding and that sort of thing? Um, so we have a bunch of these analysis in the paper. And we've really been trying this framework on a bunch of different data sets. And so with Lila Zole, we tried it on some pediatric data uh, that she had from 20 day old scans to a two years um, old. And this is kind of very preliminary stuff. Um, but you can see some interesting changes, for example, the flip and white matter and so on. Um, We've recently um, sort of submitted a paper on improving this just to kind of get sharper images and so on um, with a group at NYU led by a student, uh, Neil Day. And uh, this, is the D this is data from the DHCP um, data set and you know, it covers 29 weeks to 44 weeks. And um, it's also learning the segmentations at different weeks. Um, these atlases are significantly sharper than the ones I just showed you. Um, and so we're really excited. I mean, these are all kind of preliminary results, uh, but, but we're really excited that you can sort of learn templates fairly easy now. And at the end of the day, you don't just get the templates, you get these, the templates and this network that can immediately register any image that you have to these templates. And so if you, want to segment these subjects, for example, it's very easy to propagate segmentations. It's all done in you know, the span of a second if you have a GPU uh, once you've trained your network. Um, so I think I'm kind of out of time. So I'm just going to, before I do a quick summary, I wanna thank everybody that's worked on this. It's a bunch of different projects and a bunch that I didn't get to. Um, so I wanna take, especially all the students who are obviously doing the brunt of the work. Um, and as a summary, I want to just step back a little bit. Voxelmorph, the Voxelmorph framework, which I don't know if I mentioned before, the code is easily available. Um, there's a sort of fairly rich uh, discussion board uh, and we're sort of working on how to put this into FreeSurfer. Um, the idea of this framework is to take a lot of the classical insights um, about how to do registration, combine this with concepts from neural networks so that we get kind of the best of all worlds. We get really fast registration with the guarantees of the classical modeling. And that turns out to allow us to do all kinds of things like train with very little data, incorporate other data like segmentations or like the age of the patients, build atlases, um, uh, sort of be able to register the types of data that we couldn't before easily like, like clinical data and so on. Um, and that's it, thank you.